Ahead on KCCI Close Up, the battle continues. Rita Hart's campaign plans to challenge the results in Iowa's 2nd Congressional District. We speak to Hart and her opponent, Marionette Miller Meeks, on taking the fight to Congress. Plus, hundreds of Iowa families could be evicted from their homes next month. We speak to local leaders and landlords about their plans moving forward. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close Up. This morning, it is still uncertain who will represent Iowa's 2nd Congressional District in Washington. A recount showed Republican Marionette Miller Meeks beat Democrat Rita Hart by only six votes. Now, Hart is challenging the outcome in Congress. After the election was certified on November 30th, Hart's campaign had several options to challenge the outcome. One of them included filing an appeal to the Iowa court. Instead, Hart is submitting a petition to the U.S. House of Representatives. The administration committee will then review the case and hear arguments from both campaigns. Hart said she bypassed Iowa's judicial system because a restricted timeline in the courts wouldn't allow enough time to count thousands of votes. I think we, we ought to look at the facts here, right? That um, in every county, a recount board existed of three people. One from our, on our side, one from uh, Senator Miller Meek's side, and then a, th a third person, impartial person, who was agreed on by, by those two people. And th they're the people that made the decisions as to how this recount process um, set forth. And so it was, not, um, it was not up to us, it was up to that recount board. And, uh, and they did the very best job that they could, but there was a time restraint and there were um, and there were there were um, lots of inconsistencies. There were um, uh, different uh, um, things that people were listening to, and so as a result, we did not have a uniform process across across the district. And again, that resulted, um, especially I think because of the time restraint, um, that um, there were thousands of votes that did not get looked at. Um, there are many different. Um, groups of votes that uh, need to be examined. Um, we know that um, there were votes that um, were not considered on election night that could not be considered in the recount. Um, but the, the largest uh, number of votes, I think, um, that we're concerned about is the fact that, again, because of uh, we have a, a situation with this, with the way the recount is, uh, is um, set up, that that there is this uh, November 30th deadline. And so as a result, there were some counties that did not look at um, the overvotes and the undervotes. And, and so nobody laid eyes on those votes to determine what voter intent was. And uh, as Senator Miller Meeks uh, said in, in, on uh, Iowa Press the other night, as a result, people's votes did not get counted. And that's that's the, the whole crux of, of why we need to take this to the next step to make sure that everybody gets, that, that it's a fair process, that everybody's vote got looked at and got counted accordingly. Hart says it's no surprise that this race ended up close. I think it's, uh, it's, it's exactly what we've known from the beginning of this campaign, that this is definitely a toss up district. Um, that this is a, a district that once uh, once um, Dave Lopesack decided to retire, that um, it truly is a, um, a a very evenly split district that um, that um, is truly a toss up, and so that's the way the results came out. That it's a very tight race. Hart says, no matter what happens, she's proud of the campaign that she's ran. In the end, I look back at our campaign and. And I think we ran a very positive campaign. I think we worked really hard. I think our message was clear. Um, and I think that's what's interesting now is that our entire message of our campaign throughout the entire course of the campaign was to make sure that, that every voice was being, is being heard in this district, that people in this district understand that that's what's important is that their voice is being heard and that people care about that voice. And so here we are, um, that's, that's what's happening now. I want to make sure that every vote, vote got counted, every voice is being heard across this district. 
Hart will have until December 30th to file her petition to the House, and Miller Meeks will have 30 additional days to respond. Still ahead, we hear from Marionette Miller Meeks on the Hart campaign's petition to Congress. Let's get to it, America. Because Welcome back. We've heard from Democrat Rita Hart on why she's challenging the recount of Iowa's 2nd Congressional District. Now let's hear from her opponent. KCCI's Bo Bowman spoke to Marionette Miller-Meeks about what's next. How do you feel about um, the process moving forward? We have election laws here in Iowa. They're very scripted. Uh, we know what the procedure is. We know how elections are run. We know what the process is, so everybody knows the process. They also know... Um, you know, through Iowa law, what can be done, uh, uh, the legal ballots. And um, so that process was followed. We had an election on November the 3rd. At that time, I won uh, the majority of the votes uh, through that election process by Iowa law. Um, absentee ballots and provisional ballots can come in if they're postmarked by the day before the election. They have up until that Monday. That was November 9th. And then the counties do their official county canvases on November 9th and November 10th. And then at the end of that process, after the audit and the official county um, uh, canvas, I was still ahead. So I was still uh, winning this election. And at that point in time, you have three days in which you can request a recount. Uh, either party can do that. A recount was uh, was requested and that recount was done. And after that recount was done at the uh, direction and um, and how it was desired to be done by the Hart campaign, I was still ahead. Now, granted, it's a narrow victory, but I was ahead at that time. After that process, if you still think that there were irregularities, then you can appeal and petition to the Iowa courts. And then Iowans still have a say in their election process and who that representative is. But Rita Hart dismisses our court system, does not have confidence in our you know, election laws, in our election procedures, in our county auditors who have worked mammoth hours in trying to uh, proceed through this recount process. And she doesn't have any confidence or faith in our um, court system, so she's jumped over all of that and is trying to override and undermine the election process in Iowa by going to a partisan political process. So it's disappointing, it's disheartening, but nonetheless, that is uh, you know, her legal right to do so. In Iowa, we think things should be done by Iowans. Iowans voted, and I think this process of going to a, a political partisan process in Washington, D.C., where one person from California and another Democrat from Maryland can decide an election and disenfranchises hundreds of thousands of voters here in Iowa. Um, both campaigns, and you kind of touched on it here, both campaigns, a common theme coming out of this has, um, you've both said, every vote counts. You guys want to make sure every Iowan's voice is heard in this election. Now that it's over, the Hart campaign is saying that um, not every legal vote was counted. I guess, what is your response to that? 
Every legal vote was counted. What Rita Hart wants to do is to, to not follow the rules of Iowa law. She wants a, uh, a partisan uh, political process in Washington, D.C. to override Iowa law. Our law is very specific on, uh, on ballots, on the election process, and what happens after election and through the recount. So she wants to undermine Iowa law. She wants somebody else to determine who should be our representative. And to me, that's the voices of Iowa. Every vote was counted. Every vote was recounted. I've been certified as the Congresswoman-elect, and a bipartisan uh, executive council has unanimously supported that certificate of election. So um, I think that it's, you know, to undermine the voters, to undermine confidence in our election system. If you think that there is a problem with our election system, then legislate that like we did this past session. Put that into law, bring that forward. But every vote was counted, every legal vote was counted, every vote was heard. And throughout that process, at every step of the way, I was ahead in this process and am now certified as the Congresswoman-elect. And I just want people to know and have confidence. I have faith uh, in the county auditors who worked tirelessly uh, through this election process. I have faith in our election law system and the things that we passed in the legislation, legislature this past session. And I have faith in our court system, in the Iowa court system, that they would do this fairly and impartially. And so it's a shame that we uh, then track over the Iowa court system, over the voices of Iowa, uh, disenfranchising hundreds of thousands of voters to go to a political partisan process. So I look forward to being sworn in on January 3rd, and I will do my best to reach out to all Iowans, regardless of their political party, regardless of whether they voted for me or not, and to represent uh, their uh, concerns, their issues in Congress, so that Iowa can continue to be the best first place to live, work, and raise a family. Next on Close Up, we talk about the pending eviction crisis impacting many Iowans. Hear from local leaders fighting to keep families in their homes. She was in the hospital uh, for about a week in intensive. Right now, hundreds of families in Iowa can't pay their rent due to the coronavirus pandemic. Last week, the city of Des Moines reallocated $500,000 to help families pay their rent, but many more are still facing evictions. KCCI's Cynthia Fodor spoke to Polk County Housing Trust Fund on what still needs to be done. 
how great is the need right now? What uh, what are you seeing as the problem out there with people not being able to pay their rent? Well, we're we're running into a kind of a double a double whammy. First of all, the um, we're seeing a lot of folks come from what I call the 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 service workforce. Um, you know, whether or not they're clerks at convenience stores or, or bartenders or waiters or waitresses that are just not knowing from day to day, from week to week, whether or not their establishment's going to be open for what kind of business, for how long. And so they, they're being whipsawed, um, in, um, in knowing how much money they're going to make and and rent payments are suffering and then you add to that we're coming upon um the end of the calendar year when a lot of programs that have been established for rental assistance are coming to an end and they're running out of money so what what's your message for tenants and landlords right now with a new year coming up um well, be patient lot, and maybe help is on the way in the new year. Yeah, so hang tight. Um, you know, there are still a couple of programs that have money uh, for rental assistance. We are one of them. So if you end up at the Justice Center, hopefully at least through Christmas, we'll still be there uh, with dollars. And then Polk County General Assistance um, has some dollars that it has made available uh, for emergency rental assistance. You know, you, you think about where do these people go? I mean, it, it's kind of that leads to more people in shelters or possible ho more homelessness in our community. This is, this is really a, at its heart, this is a homeless prevention program. I mean that's what we're that's what we're doing. We're we're trying to prevent folks, families, and individuals from becoming homeless. And you know some of these families, if they are evicted, some of them will end up living in their cars. Um, some of them will end up um, doubling up with relatives, which is not a, a an ideal situation in a public health crisis. Um, when you start putting more people into a, a confined space. Some of them will end up uh, in, in homeless shelters, will end up down at Central Iowa Shelter Services. Hardest stories for me are the folks that have never had to navigate this problem before. And a lot of times those are, are single people, single men. Single men are really hard for me because they come in and, and, and first of all, they're all very apologetic. They're sorry. They're sorry that they're here. They feel guilty that they're here. I had one guy tell me, he says, I have never been late on a bill in my life. He says, I can't support myself anymore on what I can make. And he said, so I'm behind on my rent and I guess I'm getting kicked out. And I said, no, you're not. And then when the guys cry, it makes it it makes it worse, you know, because they do. They'll sit there and they'll cry. They'll try and hide it, but but they cry because this is the first time in their life that they have not been able to, you know, to pay the rent, put gas in the truck, and maybe have a little money left over to play a couple of games of pool at the, you know, at the local bar. Um and which they can't even do anymore. <laughs> which they can't even do anymore. That's right. And so it's a, it's really a sad situation. And we also spoke to J.B. Conlin of Conlin Properties in Des Moines. He gives his take on how landlords and tenants can get through these challenging times. How much of a problem has it been for you uh, seeing people who are just unable to pay their rent no oh, it's it's been uh you know it's it's always tough for housing providers to go through that eviction process and especially now going through that eviction process in the middle of a pandemic it's it's tough on the staff not to say that it's 
it's it's toughest on the residents. So I think we all got to keep that in mind. No housing provider wants to evict a tenant for non-payment of, of rent, especially in the middle of, of a pandemic. The problem is that housing providers have costs and those costs have to be covered. Uh, and a lot of people, you, you know, you understand that, that uh, your rent about uh, five cents of every dollar makes it to the bottom line for the landlord and the landlord has costs that need to keep the building safe, the power on, the water on, those types of things, pay the mortgage. Those costs never stop, pandemic or not. And so those costs have to be paid, employees have to be paid and the businesses that the property support has to be paid. The person that shovels the snow or mows the uh, lawn, those businesses, those small businesses have to be paid. So uh, the, the key thing that I think landlords need to do and tenants need to do right now is, is work together and communicate. I would advise any tenant that is facing eviction to communicate with your manager, communicate with your landlord, let them know what you are doing and get a list from that landlord of what available resources there are to help the people that can't pay their rent because of COVID get that rent paid. That is, that is something that, that we've been trying to do with, with all of our tenants to make sure that they have those resources. Problem is there's not enough resources out there. So tenants need to act now before they get that eviction notice so they can get in process and, and get those funds in hand so they don't face eviction. That's, that's the key to this whole thing. Still to come, the Civic Center could soon be closed. We talked to Des Moines Performing Arts about the dire need for help. Hey guys, listen up! Well, the Civic Center could go dark unless Des Moines Performing Arts gets more money. Coronavirus has prevented them from holding shows for months. I spoke to the organization's director of development about his concerns for the future. What is the situation like right now? Can you explain how dire it is with how impacted you guys have been from the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so our challenge really is that we don't have a timeline for reopening. We don't know when Broadway shows will return or when artists will feel comfortable returning to the venue or when it will be safe for audiences to return and safety is our, our top priority. So um, it is primarily the unknown that is driving the difficulty in our situation. And um, as a result of how our organization functions. I mean, we bring in artists from all around the world to play here in Des Moines. We don't have 
artists. We don't have set makers here. So we can't produce our own art and put that um, out for the community. And um, that means that we're relying on philanthropic support even more than normally. I mean, um, in a given year, we, we have the Willis Broadway series that brings in a, most of our revenue. Every other performance that we have on the Civic Center stage or in the Temple Theater is donor supported. And so we we sort of always rely on some sort of philanthropic support from individuals or the business community, but now that's really our only revenue. Yeah. So what do you guys need to turn things around? Is there a specific dollar sign that you're trying to reach from those giving donations and how can those donating um, help in, in any sort of capacity? Yeah, so the, the simple answer is honestly, every dollar that we get uh, keeps moving out our our ongoing uh, ability to provide some of the virtual programming that we're doing now, um, or to be able to be ready to reopen whenever that happens. But again, the difficulty is not knowing when reopening looks like. We don't have a, a specific dollar amount necessarily, but individuals or um, or businesses or organizations can help out by, uh, by helping out through that philanthropic giving and um, making sure that we're protecting the arts here in central Iowa. And Governor Reynolds launched the Iowa Arts and Cultural Recovery Program. Have you guys applied in that uh, $7 million allocated funds? You guys can receive up to $250,000 by the looks of it. How much will that help and how much is still needed? Yeah, so we're grateful to Governor Reynolds for making that available. The If we are eligible and receive the maximum award, the $250,000, that certainly would help. It would um, it would make a big difference. Um, and we're certainly hopeful. Uh, but that's a statewide grant application that's very competitive. And um, we're we're including all of the information about the economic impact that we have here in central Iowa, $36 million for restaurants and bars, hotels and you know, even parking garages for the city of Des Moines uh, and the kids that we're supporting now throughout the entire state of Iowa. On uh, a normal year, it's 50,000 kids that that come to the uh, Civic Center for kit for programming for field trips. Uh, and now it's entirely statewide and we're doing that virtually. So those are all good reasons to be able to um, to hope for that grant amount. But uh, we're we're unclear as to whether or not that will uh, come in at the, the level that we would want it to. And the Iowa Department of Culture, so when this hits and people kind of learn about part of the funding went to, and it is two and a half percent of the economy performing arts in the state of Iowa. So when this hits, um, will there be an education effort on your guys' part to say, yes, that helps us a little bit with some operational costs, but we can't do plays or live performances as normal until the fall of 2021. So we still need your help to keep going and provide this for the state of Iowa and central Iowa. Absolutely. And that was the intention with our um, communications today and throughout the pandemic. What we've been talking to our supporters about is how that ongoing support is necessary and how a donor subsidy is, is really what's going to make those uh, educational programs available or those subsidized programs available until Broadway performances resume. Thank you for joining us for KCCI 8 News Close Up. We will see you back here next Sunday.